The Phoenix Theater and Arts Company's audio drama series presents a collection of summer poetry, curated and directed by Gina Stanton. For past episodes, upcoming events, and other information, make sure to visit our website at phoenixtheaterartsco.com. That's theater with an R-E. Before we get to this week's episode, PTAC would like to wish the warmest of congratulations to Sam Steer and Brian Sanishin on their wedding. We are so happy for you both and are thrilled that you're a part of PTAC. Without further ado, we give you Summer Poetry. Summer Rain by Fanny Isabel Sherrick Oh, what is so pure as the glad summer rain that falls on the grass where the sunlight has lain? And what is so fair as the flowers that lie all bathed in the tears of the soft summer sky? The blue of the heavens is dimmed by the rain that wears away sorrow and washes out pain. But we know that the flowers we cherish would die were it not for the tears of the cloud-laden sky. The rose is the sweeter when kissed by the rain, and hearts are the dearer where sorrow has lain. The sky is the fairer that rain clouds have swept, and no eyes are so bright as the eyes that have wept. Oh, they are so happy, these flowers that die. They laugh in the sunshine, oh, why cannot I? They droop in the shadow, they smile in the sun, yet they die in the winter when summer is done. The lily is lovely and fragrant her breath, but the beauty she wears is the emblem of death. The rain is so fair as it falls on the flowers, but the clouds are the shadows of sunnier hours. Why laugh in the sunshine? Why smile in the rain? The world is a shadow and life is a pain. Why live in the summer? Why dream in the sun to die in the winter when the summer is done? Oh, there is the truth that each life underlies, that baffles the poets and sages so wise. Ah, there is the bitter that lies in the sweet as we gather the roses that bloom at our feet. Oh, flowers, forgive me. (laughs) I'm willful today. Oh, take back the lesson you gave me, I pray. For I slept in the sunshine... I woke in the rain, and it banished forever my sorrow and pain. The Ocean by Nathaniel Hawthorne The ocean has its silent caves, deep, quiet, and alone. Though there be fury on the waves, beneath them there is none. The awful spirits of the deep hold their communion there, and there are those for whom we weep, the young, the bright, the fair. Calmly the wearied seamen rest beneath their own blue sea. The ocean solitudes are blessed, for there is purity. The earth has guilt, the earth has care, unquiet are its graves. But peaceful sleep is ever there beneath the dark blue waves. Sonnet 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? By William Shakespeare. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. And summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair some time declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Casey at the Bat by Ernest Lawrence Thayer The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood four to two, with but one inning more to play. And when Cooney died at first, and Barrows did the same, a pall-like silence fell upon the patrons of the game. 
A straggling few got up to go in deep despair, the rest clung to the hope which springs eternal in the human breast. They thought, if only Casey could but get a whack at that, we put up even money now with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, as did also Jimmy Blake, and the former was a hoodoo, while the latter was a cake. So upon that stricken multitude, grim melancholy sat, for there seemed but little chance of Casey getting to the bat. But Flynn let drive a single to the wonderment of all, and Blake, the much despised, tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted and men saw what had occurred, there was Jimmy safe at second, and Flynn a hugging third. Then from five thousand throats and more there rose a lusty yell. It rumbled through the valley, it rattled in the dell, it pounded on the mountain and recoiled upon the flat, for Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. There was pride in Casey's bearing, and a smile lit Casey's face. And when, responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat, no stranger in the crowd could doubt t'was Casey at the bat. Ten thousand eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. Five thousand tongues applauded when he wiped them on his shirt. Then while the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance flashed in Casey's eye. A sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered sphere came hurtling through the air, and Casey stood a-watching it in haughty grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. From the benches black with people, there went up a muffled roar, like the beating of the storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him! Kill the umpire! shouted someone on the stand. And it's likely they'd have killed him, had not Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity, great Casey's visage shone. He stilled the rising tumult. He bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher, and once more the dun sphere flew. But Casey still ignored it, and the umpire said, Strike two! Fraud! cried the maddened thousands, and the echo answered, Fraud! But one scornful look from Casey, and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold. They saw his muscles strain. And they knew that Casey wouldn't let that ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lip. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go, and now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. A Jellyfish by Marianne Moore Visible, invisible, a fluctuating charm. An amber-colored amethyst inhabits it. Your arm approaches, and it opens, and it closes. You have meant to catch it, and it shrivels. You abandon your intent. It opens, and it closes, and you reach for it. The blue surrounding it grows cloudy, and it floats away from you. A Sea Dirge by Lewis Carroll There are certain things, a spider, a ghost, the income tax, gout, an umbrella for three, that I hate. But the thing that I hate the most is a thing they call the sea. Pour some salt water over the floor. Ugly, I'm sure you'll allow it to be. Suppose it extended a mile or more. 
that's very like the sea. Beat a dog till it howls outright, cruel but all very well for a spree. Suppose that one did so day and night, that would be like the sea. I had a vision of nursery maids, tens of thousands passed by me, all leading children with wooden spades, and this was by the sea. Who invented those spades of wood? Who was it cut them out of the tree? None, I think, but an idiot could, or one that loved the sea. It is pleasant and dreamy, no doubt, to float with thoughts as boundless and souls as free. But suppose that you are very unwell in a boat. How then do you like the sea? Oh, there is an insect that people avoid. Whence is derived the verb to flee? Where have you been by it most annoyed? In lodgings by the sea. If you like coffee with sand for dregs, a decided hint of salt in your tea, and a fishy taste in the very eggs, by all means choose the sea. And if, with these dainties to drink and eat, you prefer not a vestige of grass or tree, and a chronic state of wet in your feet, then I recommend the sea. For I have friends who dwell by the coast, pleasant friends they are to me. It is when I'm with them that I wonder most that anyone likes the sea. They take me a walk, though tired and stiff, to climb the heights I madly agree, and after a tumble or so from the cliff, they kindly suggest the sea. I try the rocks, and I think it cool that they laugh with such an excess of glee, as I heavily slip into every pool that skirts the cold, cold sea. P-Tax Audio Drama Series is a production by the Phoenix Theatre and Arts Company. This week's episode, Summer Poetry, was curated, directed, and edited by Gina Stanton. This episode features the vocal talents of Kim Smith, Devin Traeger, Jenna Isabella, Mike Stanton, Jennifer Wallace, and Gina Stanton. Original P-Tac music by Brian Sanishin. For a full listing of credits, visit us at phoenixtheaterartsco.com. That's theater with an R-E. While you're there, please consider clicking the donate link. That would be delightful. Have comments or questions? Email us at phoenixtheaterartsco at gmail.com or find us on social media. A very special thank you to our Patreon subscribers with a shout out to those sitting in the box seats, Ken Shelby, and on stage seating, Margaret Thurston. We couldn't do this without you. Join us next time for An Ideal Husband, Part 1. Part of our repertory season, P-Tac Goes Wild, featuring the works of Oscar Wilde.